Hello, everyone. Um, I think we can get started on uh, intro to computer vision now. So uh, let's jump right into it. Um, so brief introduction. Hi, my name's Christy Gao. I'm a 4A computer science student at the University of Waterloo. Um, I am a software engineer by trade. I've worked at some larger tech companies and smaller ones. Most recently, I worked at a startup called Peggy, um, where I worked on some art fraud detection computer vision algorithms. Prior to that, I worked at Cockroach Labs, Google, and PayPal, just to name a few. Um, so today, let's just get right into our agenda. Um, we're going to talk about the goals of this workshop. We'll talk a bit about what computer vision actually means, uh, some computer vision problems, some traditional solutions to those problems, some deep learning solutions to those problems. We'll go through a very quick demo um, with Detectron 2 to give you some practical tools for your hackathon project. And we will talk about putting all together along with some further reading if you're interested. So today's goals. Um, so just to have a clear understanding of what we're going to be talking about today, we'll be discussing computer vision concepts, computer vision problems, uh, and some high-level solutions to those problems. But we will not, and we will be using an existing model uh, for object detection. But we will not be training our own models today. We'll not be doing an in-depth guide on machine learning tools um, or machine learning itself. I'm not a machine learning expert by any means. Um, so we'll be having a focus mainly on the computer vision problems and uh, aspects of any machine learning problems. So with that in mind, uh, let's answer a question you might be asking yourself right now. And I certainly was asking myself um, before I got into computer vision, what is it, computer vision exactly? Um, I think a logical follow-up question is, um, what is vision? Um, so if we think about the way you and I might experience vision, um, there is a real world in which we have sensors to get data from. So for example, our eyes, um, our bodies have tons of other sensors like ears, taste, whatever. Um, but let's talk about like vision. So we have our eyes, we get information from the real world. Our brains uh, process that data from the sensors and then extract meaning from it. Um, so if we want to have a conversation about computer vision, we can have a uh, electronic or digital parallel to that. So we still have the same real world. Um, but instead we have electronic sensors. So for example, maybe a camera or a LIDAR or something like that. Um, so our electronic sensors um, get data from the real world and then we can write code to interpret that data um, and then extract meaning. So when I look at this abomination on the left-hand side, I see a meme, I see a dog, I might um, relate to some other cultural ideas from the internet like thick, um, and uh, I might know it's a Shiba, I might know it's Photoshopped. And similarly, um, we might aspire to write code that can extract the same interpretations. Um, so to kind of put more concretely what a computer sees, um, we'll just talk about images for now since that's more intuitive to understand. But the way images are stored um, is that they're simply just a massive matrix where each pixel um, is rented by, represented by some number. Um, and in the case of colored pictures, each pixel is actually represented by a number of channels. Um, for example, you might have a red, green, blue channel per pixel, um, where the numbers together generate a unique color um, somewhere on the color spectrum. Um, so that's what a computer is actually receiving in terms of data. It's a big matrix of numbers. Um, but what can we actually interpret from that data? Um, kind of just to hammer home interpretation as a problem in computer vision. Um, we'll go with another example for this image. We see a sad white fluffy cat. There's a laptop in the midground. The laptop is on some kind of website. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the website is. The room has white lighting. The room has a kind of white or cream paint. Um, the room has shutters. Uh, and there's so much more we can continue to interpolate from this. Um, the cat could be photoshopped. Those eyes look a little too glossy, but it's a pretty low resolution image, so I could be wrong. Um, I might infer that it's nighttime during this picture, but I could also totally be wrong about that, um, and so on and so forth. So we can jump right into the computer vision problems, um, where basically every single interpretation I just gave you, those um, images of the dog and the cat, 
um, can be a problem that needs to be solved. It can be code that can be written to answer those questions. Um, and so we'll just jump into some of the more common uh, problems to solve in computer vision. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, and if at any point anyone has questions, like please feel free to drop them in the Slido. Um, so first, filtering. Uh, something you've probably encountered before. If you've ever used Instagram or Snapchat, you take a beautiful picture, you want to add some colors to it, um, you want to adjust the lighting a bit. Um, very simple uh, computer vision problem to solve. All you do is you get into the color channel of what you want to modify, and you just change the raw number value. So if you want to make your color, you want to make your picture more red, just get into the red channel of that um, three by the that three dimensional matrix that is your image, um, and move the numbers to be more red leaning. Um, if you want to make your picture more blue, get into the blue channel and add some numbers to it. Um, so all the fun filters on Instagram, it's just applying um, very basic matrix addition over the uh, matrix that is your image. A slightly more complicated application, if you're familiar with digital art, um, there's lots of, and or um, digital art or photo editing, there's lots of different kinds of layers out there. There's overlays, hard lights, soft lights, um, multiply. These layer modes are all just different ways of applying color. Um, on top of your um, existing layers. Um, and so some of the best digital artists you'll see uh, can really memorize how overlays exactly shift lighting, how hard lights shift lighting, and so on and so forth. So that's a little um, snippet from Color with Kurt, who's a really good colorist in digital art. So um, something a bit more complicated is feature detection and matching. This is the basis. Um, this is a problem that has to be solved to solve a plenty of other computer vision problems that we'll get into. But basically, it's the problem of finding features and matching them um, and recognizing them in other settings. So for example, um, the image on the left, it's uh, recognizing the features on this like cereal box or peanut box um, in a different setting. Um, and another fun example uh, is also in like AR. Um, so for example, Pokemon Go, when you start battling a Pokemon, um, you need to, the program needs to figure out where to place the Pokemon. And as you move closer and farther from it, um, it adjusts the Pokemon's distance from there. So it needs to continuously match to the um, initial position that it put down the Pokemon in your real scene. Um, so there's plenty of different feature detection and matching algorithms out there. Some are more time efficient on gener detecting the features, but um, less efficient on matching. Some are more correct um, and are more reliably getting the correct features and matching them. Um, but sometimes you don't need to be 100% correct. Sometimes you just need to be good enough to render it quickly in your smartphone so that you can catch a Pokemon. Um, so kind of building off of the feature detection and matching, um, next we have transformations. Um, the first application where I think like transformations and feature detections really um, meld together uh, in a very intuitive way is making panoramas. Um, so when you take a panorama picture with your phone, your phone is actually just taking a ton of pictures um, sequentially and then detecting the same features across the images and shifting them together. Now, how does it actually do the shift? Um, so recall earlier that the images that you have are all just pixels. They're all matrix matrices of pixels. Um, and so you can shift them accordingly in like linear algebra space, if you can remember from like linear algebra one class or whatever. Um, so if you've also used like image editors before, you might have been able, you might have noticed there's like ways to tilt your image forward, forward towards you, the viewer, farther from you, the viewer, um, rotate it, skew it, crop it, shorten it, stretch it. Um, these are all just matrix, matrix transformations where you're compressing data, you're illuminating data, you're moving, rotating data in all sorts of different ways. So any matrix math you can think of, you can just apply to your images. Um, so that's that's a bit of the panoramas and the transformations. Um, another example of like the kind of more complicated transformations are those 3D panoramas you might have seen before on like Facebook or YouTube, where you can click into them and like drag your camera position around and explore the space. Um, and uh, some of those 3D spaces are also used for like virtual reality experience, where you can kind of use your um, view to look around as well. So continuing to build off of the feature detection we discussed earlier, um, you can actually get structures um, from, like render entire structures and points um, relative to each other um, using multiple images of the same, um, same object. 
Um, so across multiple views, you can detect the same features, figure out how um, far apart each of the views are, and rel uh, generally speaking, um, find the relative position of different features from each other, um, and generate an entire 3D model from just a bunch of images. Uh, so there's an example on the left uh, just representing how, how that geometry kind of works out. Um, the, don't worry about the pink and blue lines. That gets into the, like, the nitty gritty details of epipolar geometry. Um, but another example that is more tangible and some of you might have experienced before is um, Apple's AR kit. You can scan an image and take multiple pictures of it from different sides, and it'll find all the feature points and also um, keep them marked and localized while you move your phone around it. It's a fun experience. Um, so I kind of alluded to this in the last slide about how you can figure out the relative position of different features from each other. Um, and so similarly, and that's that's involving um, stereo motion or uh, more simply put, finding depth um, and figuring out depth from different 2D images. Um, so fun little rule is that uh, when you're looking at things, um, things closer to you move more quickly in a view than things farther away from you. Uh, and if you can find the features of all those different objects, you can figure out depth maps um, from that principle that things closer to you move more. Um, so here's an example of like a left image, right image of the same view, and then finding the disparity map between them. So next is a very large space um, and very active area of research, which is segmentation. So segmenting um, is very generally speaking, just to segment things, to separate things, to group things together. Um, whether or not it's going to be useful for your specific problem is always going to be uh, up to debate. Um, but we can talk about some very simple segmentation problems. Um, on the left is segmenting the foreground from the background, um, so separating the dog from the grass. On the right is a case mean segmentation, so that um, involves grouping everything of similar colors together, um, which creates a little cute mosaic image um, it's actually a little bit buggy. As you can see in the middle, there's some uh, green blobs where there shouldn't be, um, but can actually be very useful in um, like data analysis when you want to segment groups that are very similar together to each other and so on. Um, and again, very uh, big area of problems to solve. Um, so there's more specific different kinds of segmentation. Um, getting semantic segmentation, so being able to tell that something, some area of pixels is a person. Um, instant segmentation takes it another step further by uh, segmenting each uh, section of the blob into different individual people. Um, and uh, on the right, you can see a bit of a sneak peek um, for the model that we're going to be demoing later, Detectron 2. But um, we've, our models have, not ours, but you know, humanity uh, has gotten computer vision models good enough to be able to detect the same image even when it's been spliced. So for example, in that image, you can see um, the horse, the same horse in teal um, is recognized to be the same exact uh, horse being, despite having been covered in the middle by the person's leg. So before I move into some of the solutions to computer vision problems, does anyone have any questions? I'll just poke over to the Slido. All right. Um, if not, I'll uh, keep pushing on. All right, so uh, let's jump into some of the traditional or classical solutions to these computer vision problems. Um, so when I say traditional or classical, um, solutions, I mean solutions that um, predate deep learning um, and generally speaking, uh, just take advantage of real world geometry and math to solve problems. Um, so thankfully, we live in a universe where the laws of geometry are, uh, and yeah, the laws of geometry and perspective are very reliable. Um, if you remember grade 11 um, or like grade 10 optics, um, I'm sure you might have taken a class about lenses and how different rays of lights form. Um, these are all rules that we can apply in computer vision um, to solve some interesting problems. Um, so earlier, I kind of alluded to epipolar geometry um, and as a way to solve uh, the structure from motion problem. Um, and it really just involves figuring out how like the relative position of the different views that were taken of the same structure, um, detecting your features, 
and then based on that, adjusting the positioning of where those features should exist in 3D space. Um, again, this is grossly simplified, but I won't get into the nitty gritty details of it and bore you to death with a linear algebra lecture. Um, another thing I alluded to earlier is how closer objects move more. When you move your head around, you can just like pick a lamp or a spot on the wall, move your head around right now and kind of look at that. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, if you can just detect the features um, across two different scenes and see how quickly they move um, or how much distance they move within the same scenes, um, then you can have an idea of how close or far items are between scenes. Um, I had mentioned feature detection earlier. Um, so very generally speaking, again, uh, there are mathematical ways of representing basic edge detections. Um, so uh, again, very generally speaking, you can kind of represent how quickly values of pixels change in color or intensity. Um, if it's a sharp change from a dark region to a light region, um, if it's a very gradual change and so on. Um, and with that information, you can um, try to sample different windows across your entire scene um, and detect different types of edges. Um, so that's kind of like the very early ways of detecting edges with just pure math. Um, and uh, if you can recall a day before smartphones, um, there used to be like these little digital cameras you could buy from Walmart for about a hundred bucks. Um, and all they did is take like kind of crappy pictures. Um, and if you hit the button to take the camera picture, um, if you just held it halfway down, it would like draw boxes around people's faces. Um, and so Facebook, that's like just an example of like how you might have interacted with face detection in the past. Um, and face detection is something that's been around for a long time. Um, and definitely before deep learning was widely um, available and used in commercial settings. Um, and the way they've been able to do it is that faces are very um, simple structures, honestly. You just have two eyes and a mouth for the most part. Um, and then you scan across an entire scene for those two eyes and mouths. Um, now, of course, I'm speaking very generally again. Um, things can get very complicated. For example, um, the edge detection that I had mentioned earlier um, has a lot of details that are glossed over. Uh, so for example, if you have like a really large window, um, you might actually not uh, catch the like edges that would have actually helped you match your features correctly. Or if you have too small of a window, you might only ever see no edge or like really strong straight edges uh, rather than corners and so on. So there's been a number of advancements in the field. Um, the diagram on the uh, right is a very intimidating diagram of how features are detected in um, a very uh, impactful paper in the feature detection space called SIFT. Um, SIFT extracts features that um, have descriptors that are scale invariant, um, rotation invariant, um, and unique to match. Um, so what that means is that, uh, it's a little far back to, for me to go back to that slide, but you can detect features in an image um, of an object uh, in one angle, one kind of like scale and lighting situation. Um, and then you'll be able to match the features based on the unique descriptions um, in a totally different scene where the image is like rotated or um, the image is really far away and so on and so forth. Um, so lots of different um, ways to detect features and lots of like details and nuances there. Um, so kind of last part on traditional solutions. Um, the segmentation uh, area it does have a fair amount of traditional solution, um, traditional solutions in it. Even though we often think of segmentation as a very like deep learning oriented problem. Um, so, for example, there the two algorithms um, I didn't really mention earlier on the dog and the roses are um, graph cut and k means um, respectively. Um, and so, very generally speaking, again, it's just a matter of grouping similar things together. Um, the interesting thing about the graph cut algorithm is that you have to provide the algorithm some data on the two different categories that you're segmenting. So you can see the like darker red spots here and the darker blue spots here. These are all um, data that I gave the um, algorithm. And based on that, it grouped everything that looked like, you know, was within reasonably, reasonably looked like the fur um, from these two red samples together, making the dog and it grouped everything reasonably similar to this grass patch that I gave it together, um, solidifying the grass as well. And uh, just a fun um, 
fun fact I thought I might share uh, that I think will also get your brain thinking about the different ways that you can combine computer vision solutions together. Um, I won't claim to know how Zoom operates or what their algorithms are, but if you were to, say, produce a um, video calling platform and you want to add fun backgrounds into the, um, like, give fun backgrounds to users, um, you could do a face detection, um, use that as input data into a graph cut, therefore separating the foreground and background, um, and then just put a fun palm tree over the background. So lots of ways to connect traditional solutions together to solve um, interesting problems. So that's a bit on the traditional solutions, um, quite linear algebra heavy. Um, so before that, let me just check the Slido. Okay, there is, uh, yeah, so there's a question. Um, what is deep learning? So that's a great question. Um, deep learning is, I use the term interchangeably with machine learning. Um, so we'll actually get into a bit of like what machine learning is, um, a very fundamental level and how it's be being applied to computer vision. So good question, the young grandpa. Um, I'll mark that as complete. And then how did you first learn computer vision? That's a good question. I think um, I'll save this question for after we get through the solutions, just to keep the train of thought going. Um, but I'll come back to that afterwards. So no other questions. So I'll jump right into it. All right. So some deep learning slash machine learning solutions. So first, um, I'll just go over what a machine learning model conceptually is. Um, again, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning th about this area myself. Um, but this is just enough information to help you kind of understand um, some of the deep learning solutions that we'll be talking about. So um, earlier, I had mentioned that there's a fair amount of subjectivity that can be involved with machine learning interpretations. Um, so, sorry, computer vision interpretations. So for example, we talked about the cat um, where, you know, I don't know if the cat's photoshopped. I don't know if the cat image was taken in um, like a room at nighttime. Um, I wasn't sure what website it was on and so on and so forth. Um, so a lot of these deep learning solutions can help us deal with that kind of subjectivity, um, especially with categorizing things. And we will actually be talking about that in more depth with the Detect One Two example. So uh, models, overly simplified. Um, think of You can think of it as a kind of black box. It's not exactly a black box to the researchers who work on them, writing them. But if you think of it as a black box that has a number of weights in it um, and has a loss function in it, um, which tells the model, how close am I to being correct on some amount of data being put into it, comparing the outputs out of it. Um, then the machine learning model can train itself on tons of training data that's maybe labeled, um, maybe not labeled, and help adjust itself to eventually tune those weights um, to a number that is most optimal over a set of test data. Um, and so basically, this black box wants to like find weights that minimize loss over training data, um, where the loss function is, again, in indicating whether or not um, the model is correctly predicting information. So for example, um, in this handwritten digit detection model, you might label all of these numbers as the numbers they're supposed to be manually. So this is a zero, this is a one, this is a two, this is a three. And I might throw the numbers into the um, machine learning model. And if it uh, reads this number and then spits out a one, it knows it's wrong. And then it'll try to correct itself accordingly. Um, and then when it tries it again, it might actually get zero correctly and it'll know those weights are good. So um, why? Why deep learning solutions? And also, um, why have deep learning solutions exploded over the last um, like decade and a half? And a big reason for that is the technology to enable this training and to enable uh, models to be like reasonably used in a commercial setting um, has greatly improved over the last decade and a half, um, arguably like two to three decades. Um, so why would you even use deep learning solutions? and? maybe we can talk about some of the um, traditional solutions improved. Um, so for example, uh, a problem I actually worked on in a, in a computer vision course I took um, is single view depth estimation. So earlier I had mentioned that you can take two views and um, take a guess at the depth um, of the scene based on the two views, but what if you don't have two views? What if you only have one? 
Um, so with clever loss functions and enough training data, you can train um, a model that can give you depth estimation based on a singular view. Um, and so this is an image of a car driving around the street. Um, something I actually didn't er mention earlier is um, image sharpening and image blurring. Um, and that's a matter of like creating masks of images. So um, creating a kind of, um, hmm, how do I describe a mask actually? Um, finding the edges in an image um, and then um, further exaggerating those edges. Um, so forcing um, values that might be in like a gray zone or blurry um, to pick a side um, to be either like completely white or completely dark and so on. Um, but there's actually a model uh, called Waifu 2.2x, uh, which um, takes sharpening images to the next level and reduces blur. Um, sorry, not not only does it reduce blur, it also reduces like JPEG um, refractors that are left there, like any noise. Um, so the deep learning solutions are just a lot better with handling um, some situations where there's more ambiguity involved or less data involved when it comes to the traditional solutions. Um, and then of course, there's the classification regression problems that everyone loves to talk about. Um, so for example, classifying objects, that's an image that I showed before, um, categorizing like the horse and the person and each different person and each different horse and so on. Um, and then similarly, there's also object classification in LiDAR, which we haven't touched upon too much, um, but LiDAR is also a uh, way of censoring um, data and spatial awareness around a sensor. Um, so I think I, I mentioned really briefly earlier that um, sometimes the training data for a model might be labeled, sometimes it won't be. Um, I also think um, computer vision solutions um, and just generally some of the, the artistic applications of computer vision can start to challenge like what art even is and what the meaning of art is. Um, so I guess for starters, uh, something that I find really cool is that there's this movie called Klaus, um, which is kind of depicted on the left here. Um, it's a very cute uh, 2D animated Christmas movie. Um, but uh, the very interesting thing about this movie is that it almost doesn't look 2D animated. It looks quite 3D for the most part. Um, and the reason for that is that they have this really impressive um, model for predicting lighting um, on top of uh, 2D flat images. So the way their, their like, animation process works is that their animators will create a flat animation um, using very simple colors and shapes. Um, and then their model, which is trained to project lighting onto um, these flat settings, um, will project lighting, just these beautiful setting, dynamic lightings um, on top of these characters. And so that's a really cool application of um, these deep learning solutions. Um, there's also generative art where um, you might have like unsupervised training. So data is like very basically not really even labeled when it comes to training the model. Um, and you just kind of like let the computer go free and see what it generates. Um, so in the middle, um, there is uh, a screenshot from a platform called Art Reader. Um, so out of curiosity, uh, feel free to just drop it in the chat. Um, how, uh, how many of these portraits do you think are of real people? Oh, maybe I should have started a poll. Um, but anyways, uh, none. Yeah, um, exactly. None of these are of real people. Um, this is a platform called Art Breeder where you can mix these portraits together um, and kind of blend different aspects of it together um, and create new portraits each time. Um, and then another uh, interesting kind of application of generative art um, is uh, this old paper where you can apply art styles onto images. Um, so you might recognize Starry Starry Night, The Scream, and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, I think this is where um, like the generative art stuff starts to overlap with so, like maybe the graphics sector and the lines of computer vision and graphics um, and some other fields start to become more blurred, um, but very interesting space to, to look into and be a part of. All right. Um, so any questions? Um, I'll check out the Slido. Also, um, my email and Twitter and everything will be like available in the hack pack. So if you ever have questions after the um, workshop, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, so first, I'll take a look at the Slido. All right. Um, how did you first learn computer vision? 
Uh, so I think I kind of fell into it by accident and I'm really grateful that I did. Um, at Waterloo, there's a course called uh, Introduction to Computer Vision and it's um, course CS484. Um, and I, uh, I just kind of took it because it sounded interesting. I had no clue what computer vision was. Um, and my plan was to just like take it and see what the syllabus is and like kind of get a vibe for the, the first lecture um, and go from there. Um, I found it really interesting um, and it was super cool to just learn more about it. I found, um, I just found it to be really engaging as well. I like that it's um, very math and algorithms heavy, but it also has that like visual intuition alongside it. I can, I think of myself as a very visual learner. Um, so yeah, first time I learned about computer vision was through university. Um, the young grandpa asks, does your math, geometry, or linear algebra need to be very strong to work with computer vision? Um, I'm personally not a super strong geometry or linear algebra person. Um, there is a decent amount of stuff required, um, at least for the course that I took. Um, and I will say my grades definitely suffered more on the very math heavy um, parts of it. But at the end of the day, there's still a ton of coding. And if you're a strong coder um, and you can just like learn the necessary algebra to get through it, um, you can uh, you can handle it. Um, yeah, so ge geometry and linear algebra skills definitely help, but are not 100% necessary. Um, I also think, um, I think that's very different if you want to be in research versus if you're fine with just being like a, produ a product based engineer. Um, personally, I'm more interested in products and um, being like a product developer. Um, and so my uh, geometry and linear algebra skills don't have to be like world class because I'm not trying to write fancy machine learning models myself. Um, but if that's something you want, then um, I think geometry and investing time into um, your geometry and linear algebra skills is important for that. But for product level stuff, don't think it's the end of the world if you're not at the best at linear algebra. Um, all right, so how do online CAPTCHA puzzles trick computer vision? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the interesting thing about CAPTCHA puzzles is that um, they're like CAPTCHA is like an entire business and their business model is they get humans to categorize images for them. And then they sell the categorized images as training data to companies that need training data to train their models. Um, and so CAPTCHA only uses images that are um, uncategorized at the moment and unable to be reliably categorized by models. Um, and so uh, as time has gone on, you might have noticed if you've like been on the internet in your younger days and now you're on the internet now, um, you'll notice that captures are kind of getting harder and harder and sometimes they fail more often. Um, and it's because capture keeps selling their own um, labeled data to uh, machine learning companies and companies that need machine learning. Um, and so all you can really imagine is like capture is going to get infinitely harder over time because the models are going to get better. Um, so in the long term, like it is going to be a very, uh, very interesting question. Like how is capture going to handle um, how, how is computer vision going to like work with CAPTCHA and how are we even going to do these like are you a robot checks anymore um, if models just get that much better? So good question. Um, if you're interested in learning more about CAPTCHA, I strongly encourage you to um, listen to uh, how I built this episode with um, his name is Pete or something. The actual founder of CAPTCHA um, has a, a podcast episode where he talks about how he founded it. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite interesting. He also went on to found Duolingo afterwards. Um, so interesting episode to listen to. Um, what were the textbooks used in that course? That course being um, the computer vision course, I'm assuming. Um, I actually didn't use any textbooks. Um, I, will, I think the uh, computer vision course website is linked in the hack pack. Um, so you, you can check out if they had any optional textbooks, but I didn't actually use any um, during the course. Um, what are some platforms we can go to learn deep learning? Um, I'll get into that actually at the end of the workshop. I have some resources and um, stuff in the hack pack for you to check out there. Um, so I'll come back to that question later. And then a question about the CCC I'll also come back to later. Um, cool. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions I need to catch up on. Um, so with that in mind, let's move to the Detectron 2 example. Uh, 
Um, so first, what is Detectron 2? Um, so Detectron 2 is one of the trained models. Um, so you can kind of plug and play with it and immediately start working with it. Um, it's an open source model. All the code is available on GitHub. Um, and it's got some state of the art object detection um, and also more features on top of that. Um, so in the repository, you can check out their projects folder um, where they have stuff like, um, uh, oh no, I forgot what it's called. The one where it, like it draws, oh, pose estimation. It has pose estimation and some other interesting um, packages there as well. And it's uh, made by Facebook AI. Um, so we're going to go through a really quick demo. Um, you don't have to have Python knowledge. You don't have to have do for your notebook knowledge. Um, but just to give you a bit of a quick explainer, so we're all on the same page. Um, very briefly speaking, Jupyter Notebook is a machine learning and data science Python tool um, that helps you really quickly prototype um, and run Python code. Um, the details of how it works are not necessary, um, but I will be using Jupyter Notebook to demo Detectron 2. Um, and I'll be using it in CoLab, which is basically the cloud version of Jupyter Notebook. It gives you a free environment, um, a very free and clean environment. So if you're like me, and you use your laptop at like a million hackathons and all the Python pads are messed up and all the dependencies are all over the place and whatnot, um, Collab is a, a lifesaver there. Um, Collab also gives you free GPU time if you want to ever train models for fun, though we will not be doing that um, today. Oh, sorry. Did not mean to go backwards. All right, so like I mentioned, going to be working really quickly with Detectron 2 in CoLab um, and see how we can apply it to a hackathon project very quickly. So this is a brand new um, CoLab document. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into uh, coding on it. So first, we need to import the Detectron um, package. So. I'll let Colab get to downloading that. And while that happens, I'll add two images that I'll be using to demonstrate. Oops, that's a spoiler. I'll add two images here to help demo. All right, so the package is installed. Um, I'm gonna import two packages here, matplotlib, which just helps um, display images in Jupyter Notebook. Um, and the actual Detectron uh, package itself. So um, from Detecto, all right. So that's been imported. Um, so now I'll take the first image and I'll just show you what it actually looks like. And then All right, so we got uh, an apple and uh, an orange on table. And uh, what we're gonna do is grab the model from the Tekton 2 um, and start to work with it. We're gonna put in our image and see um, what the model can detect in the image. So let's grab the labels, boxes, and scores from the model predicting the object detection of our image. Um, and then we can visualize our actual results. Um, and to help us better understand what we're doing, I'm just going to print out what the actual labels, boxes, and scores are. Boxes, scores, all right. So give that a second to run. All right, so we've got an orange, an apple, and a dining table detected. And we've got our red bounding boxes um, detecting the pixels uh, in which the Detectron 2 algorithm believes apples and oranges exist. 
Um, so to kind of understand the data that's going on here, let's take a look at the outputted labels, boxes, and scores. Um, so first, labels is pretty self-explanatory. Um, how this data is organized is that the index matches up for each of the boxes and the scores as well. So the dining table is the zeroth index um, label, and it's also the zeroth box here. The box draws the top left corner and the bottom right corner. So you can the way you can interpret it is that that kind of looks like zero zero. Um, and then the bottom of the box, you can't see it, but it's passed down here in 440 and 302. Um, and then similarly, uh, orange is the second thing here. The top left corner is at 200 on the x axis, 664 on the y, um, and then 420, 22, 422, and then um, 277. Ah, I can't talk about numbers. Um, so that's how you can kind of interpret the boxes here. Um, scores, on the other hand, uh, are kind of representing like the confidence level or probability um, that the uh, label is accurate in this box. So you can see that orange, the orange and the apple are both um, given really high confidence at like 99%, 94%. Um, and visually, that makes sense. These are the two most clearest items in the frame. Um, but the dining table is actually only at 75, like 73%. Um, and if we interpret this again, that kind of makes sense um, because in reality, you know, this could actually just be a piece of wood. Um, this could be like a piece of wallpaper. Um, this could be, you know, all sorts of things that we just can't um, entirely know from this image. But we can give with a fairly strong confidence of 73% um, knowledge that we can like rest easy knowing that this is probably a dining table. So Detectron 2 looks great. Um, very easy to work with, easy to just throw into your hackathon project. Um, however, uh, I do kind of want to show some of the limitations of the Tektron 2 um, and get you thinking about limitations and the way that you might want to use models. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's another picture that I'll be demoing with. So let's look at this cat. Uh, so this is a cat meme. Um, it's a uh, pretty low resolution. It's got text over it. The cat's definitely photoshopped. The beer and the drink here is probably photoshopped as well. Um, but uh, let's see how Detectron 2 kind of handles it. So I'll actually just grab this again. Um, and let's give it a run. All right, so uh, we have a hot mess here. Um, there's a ton of labels. Um, the Tartron is obviously having a bit of a hard time figuring out what's happening in this image. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's pretty unreadable with all the images, with all the boxes and labels drawn on top. But we can still kind of take a look at the data um, and find ways to you know, find ways to understand and interpret this. So we have cup, couch, remote, person, frisbee, dog, knife, face, toothbrush, um, all sorts of labels. Um, we can kind of ignore the boxes, actually. There's not super relevant to this. Um, but uh, what I want to kind of call attention to is the um, scores at the bottom. Um, so you'll notice things like things that are like pretty far out there um, are actually reasonably kind of scored. Um, and sometimes they're not so reasonably scored. So for example, the couch only has like 5% um, score there. Um, remote, on the other hand, has 76%. Um, and it seems like remote is... Uh, and also drawn in a very strange place up in this corner. Um, so the scores are all over the place. Cat, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Cat is still scored quite high um, at 93%. So that's good. It could see that there's a cat involved there. Um, but a lot of other stuff is totally all over the place. The bottle, which is the one thing that you might conceivably be confident about um, is actually still only at like a 30% um, and wine glass is at a 10%. Um, so this is not to be like, ah, Detectron's not actually very good. Detectron like socks is not good at detecting images. Um, but I think uh, this is less about like um, giving Detectron shit and more just about like, how do we actually interpret models and how do we know when to actually use them? Um, Detectron 2 is trained on a huge plethora of training data that is real pictures with like labels that make sense. 
Um, and it's not trained on weird cat memes with like tiny, tiny low resolution Photoshop with text on top. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I just want to call that like models are not going to solve all your problems. You need to find the right one that works for you. If you want a meme categorizer and meme recognizer, um, you're going to have to do a little more hunting beyond Detectron 2 um, because it's not going to have a great time handling all these situations. Um, you might then ask next, like, oh, why can't we have like a general purpose model that can detect everything? Um, and again, it's based on just the constraints and reality of training data. Um, maybe in the future, there will be a general purpose image detector that can figure out these memes as well. I'm confident that we can get there with um, in academia. Um, but I think for now, uh, just keep in mind that Detectron 2 is more oriented to um, real world images um, with like real world applications and labels that make sense. So we can kind of jump back to the slides here. Um, oh, actually, before that, uh, I'm just going to check the Slido real quick for any other questions. All right. Um, so a relevant one um, before getting back is um, how does Detectron stack up slash differ from other object detection models? That's a good question. Um, I'm actually not the most up to date on all the different object detection models. Um, but the last I checked uh, is that um, Detectron is like pretty S tier uh, among object detection models. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, they have some other features as well. So definitely worth checking them out. All right. Um, doo -doo -doo. OK, I'll get through some of the other questions um, after I just go over a few last slides. Um, so thank you for staying through that Detectron 2 uh, demo. Um, so you might be wondering, how can I actually put this all together for a hackathon project that you have to do this weekend? Um, so a suggestion uh, I might give is to put Detectron 2 into a Python API um, and respond directly to your image request with Detectron 2, however way you want to do that. Um, so the classic hackathon project is a garbage slash recycling sorter that looks at um, you know, the picture of the garbage being thrown out and puts it into the recycling or puts it into the garbage. So maybe Detectron 2 is going to be the right tool for you there. Um, I, if you're not interested in object detection for Hackathon project, um, Detectron 2 can be used for uh, pose estimation and panoptic segmentation. So check, take a look at their projects there. Um, I've also linked some of the other papers that I've mentioned. Um, and there's also so many other papers with um, at the website Papers with Code. Um, there is a ton of computer vision and other like machine learning and graphics um, papers there as well. Um, but the nice part is that you can kind of organize them by computer vision, object detection, pose estimation, whatever you're looking for. Um, and uh, usually they come with code attached as well. So read the repositories carefully. These are um, oftentimes repositories written by um, very busy grad students who um, just get it working and shipped immediately. Um, so keep like read the documentation, uh, figure out what each model needs for its own setup uh, and see if it's um, uh, you know, ready to use enough for your project. Um, I talked a lot about Detectron 2 today just because I thought object detection would be one of the more popular um, hackathon computer vision desires. Um, but if you're interested in traditional computer vision tools as well, like filtering, transforming, making panoramas, detecting features, all that stuff, OpenCV is a great package. Um, they've got a ton of stuff written in Python as well as C++. So you kind of have that option there. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in like the more traditional image processing or computer vision stuff, OpenCV is a great tool for that. So if you want to make your own model, um, I will warn, you might spend the entire hackathon training your model. It takes a very long time. Um, even on GPU, it can take you like two or three days. Um, and so I do warn against doing it for hackathon, um, just because I personally had ex bad experiences doing that. But by all means, the world's your oyster. Um, something you might find helpful is intro to machine learning, um, which is going to be held tomorrow um, during Gear Up as well. Um, and uh, just generally, in terms of like learning about models and so on, implementing your own papers um, is definitely a good exercise. So in terms of further reading, um, and just on the topic of implementing your own papers, there's um, these are all included in the Hacker Pack, by the way. Um, there's a Reddit thread with a ton of papers um, that are great for beginners. There's also some different GitHub links um, for some interesting papers to read through and implement yourself. 
If you're interested in a more formal um, environment to learn computer vision, um, I really like the course that's provided at Waterloo. Um, it's called CS484, um, and the prereqs are just, the only additional prereqs you need if you're a CS student is um, CS370. Um, I believe the engineering faculty also has its own computer vision equivalent um, in the systems design faculty. Um, but if you're not a Waterloo student, um, Udacity and Coursera both have their own computer vision courses. Their syllabi look fairly similar to the CS484 course. Um, I haven't taken them myself, but you might find them interesting and helpful. Um, and then papers of code is linked here again. PyTorch is something you might want to look into if you want to implement the papers yourself. Um, and then Colab is way better documented and really just really well documented um, and open source. So if you want more deep, not Colab, sorry. Um, Detectron 2 is really well documented. And if you want more details, the authors have a ton of documentation. They have an advanced Colab tutorial um, as well. Uh, and of course, they have um, their open source repository. We can see all the different features. So that's a bit on further reading and how to use computer vision in your hackathon project. So I know there's some questions in the Slido, so I'll get to those right now. So what are some platforms we can go to? to learn deep learning. Um, so covered that in the further reading section and that's all available on the hack pack. Um, all right, how do you implement models from papers? Um, I don't know how to describe it aside from just, just implement them, which is not a very helpful call to action, but um, I suggest looking um, at papers of code and seeing some of the code repositories attached to them. Um, and reading through them and seeing how the authors actually implemented their repositories there. Um, in particular, I think Colab and PyTorch um, as a combination is very helpful um, for beginners, especially since you probably don't have your own GPU. Um, you probably don't have your own dedicated GPU that you can use to train your models. Um, so browse paper with code, browse, browse those um, Reddit threads and uh, look into some of the community suggestions for where to start there. So I hope that was helpful. Um, how do you make time for coding projects on top of doing well in courses? Um, I don't have a good answer for this. <laughs> um, I think, I think you just have to kind of do it, um, in terms of like time management, just generally like getting time management, improving time management skills in university is really important, um, really important skill to have. Um, and uh, priorities, I think, are also really important. Um, for me, I um, have pretty mixed feelings about the idea of going to grad school. Um, that's just like a personal thing. But because of that, like, I don't necessarily prioritize grades all the time. Um, I don't prioritize being on the dean's honors list or um, any of those like really high distinctions. Um, and that's a personal choice um, because I, I do enjoy extracurriculars. I do enjoy things like organizing Hack the North, which I had done two years prior. Um, and I think it's about what do you want to prioritize and what do you want to do in your life? And if uh, academia is something that calls to you, then courses are something you have to focus on um, and you might spend less time on coding projects. Um, but if more product oriented things are what calls to you, then side projects um, and internships might be something that um, you might want to prioritize more time to. So I hope that was helpful. And um, assuming that you're earlier on in your career, best of luck with um, time management and figuring out what you want to do. Um, what is the difference between ML and AI? So this is something I'm still um, figuring out myself, but um, machine learning describes just generally models and um, the field of uh, self-tuning parameters, basically. Um, though those are not probably the terms that people in the industry use. Um, AI specifically, I believe, is um, a branch of unsupervised learning. Um, so that's where you're not necessarily um, giving your, you're not necessarily labeling um, the training data and spoon feeding it to your black box. Um, you might just be giving it a bunch of data and seeing what happens and then tuning some things um, and then trying to tune it into like some direction without any like true correct result or false result. Um, so I'm personally still learning a lot in the field, so I don't have a, a really strong answer there, um, but ML is, generally speaking, a very large field, and it has a smaller field within that.
All right. Um, any other computer vision related questions? Again, um, if you think of a question later, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or uh, at my email. Um, and also uh, on the Hack and North Discord as well, if you're going to be attending this weekend. All right. Um, so a non-computer vision related question is, uh, have I done the CCC before? I have done the CCC, though it was uh, five years ago, four years ago, back in uh, high school. So long time ago. All right, I think that's about it. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming back, of coming out to this um, computer vision workshop. I hope you learned something new. I'm always super happy and interested to talk about computer vision. Um, so again, feel free to reach out to me at uh, email or Twitter or Discord. Um, and other than that, I hope you have a great, um, great hackathon uh, and I learned something new. Um, so Hack the North has a feedback form. Um, so please uh, feel free to fill that out on Slido. Um, and there's also the hack pack for introduction to computer vision um, with all the resources. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you have a great week.